You know what a day that's going to be, huh? Sitting there thinking about it. Sorry. That day we stand before our Lord and we're just able to cry holy for all of eternity. We might as well start now. Amen. You know, I'm so thankful. Um, and, and what I mean by that is how God has led me the last few weeks to prepare for all the messages down there at camp and now has is, is been on thankfulness. So thankfulness has been on my heart and mind. And so I'm just so thankful for this church body. Um, I'm a little biased. I've been here now for about 25 years. Uh, but this is my family. You guys are my family. And um, we, had a, we had a conference a while back called Uncommon. And um, I think what you find here really in many ways is uncommon um, in, in a good way. Uh, you know, right now our pastor, um, obviously he's not here. He's up with his family, spending some time up in Rochester with his family. Deserved time. Um, he's an amazing pastor. He's an amazing shepherd. And I'm so thankful. And I'm just, I'm bringing that up because as I was sitting down there singing, just um, thinking about what God has orchestrated within our church body these last however many years, it's just amazing. It's just overwhelming at times, and I hope it overwhelms you because he's given us a shepherd that really loves you. He knows you. He knows the state of his flock. God's given him vision to take us for these past 14 years and, and even on, and we're going to continue to go and move, and I'm so thankful for him as my mentor, and, but yet at the same time, because he discipled me. He's, he's poured his life into me all these years, and then, but sitting here li listening to, to the leadership of Dwayne and, and this, this, the, the praise teams that we have here, it's just amazing. They have a way to bring us to the very throne room of the Lord, and, and I love it because God always leads him back to a place that always points to Jesus. It always points back to a place of holiness. And, 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 and I continue to say that because um, if you don't know Josh, our youth pastor, uh, that man, what you get from him is it's genuine. He really loves your children. He loves the kids that God has brought into his life with his wife, Addie. And that entire servant team is a reflection of this entire church of what true love is, an extension of that, of Jesus Christ pouring into the lives of all those around us. And we get to experience this every week when we get to come worship with our family. That's something to be, it's special. It's something that we should run after and obtain and want to be a part of because of what God is united within this church body. So I just, I wanted to share that because just getting kind of overwhelmed through the music, through where we are at right now. And, and I know throughout this church, People are being taught from the children over there engaged. We even, well, the youth, they're not in here, right? But they're down, they're down there at the camp. And um, the word of God is being taught. Lives are being changed. And that's the whole purpose of what we're doing. If we leave this auditorium or this church the same, then something's gone drastically wrong because God has got to change. And so um, it's just wonderful to be here this morning and and uh, I had the opportunity last night to be down at camp at Life Change in Clinton. And uh, it was a wonderful time. I didn't get down there till a little bit later, till right when they were going to, to dinner. Um, but yet, uh, it was amazing. It really was. And, and you can see here, the theme of our camp has is, is also been brought into this order to, uh, um, auditorium. And the theme is out of 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And the way that the Lord had led me to really speak to the young people is to take this verse, and he led me to break it up in four pieces. And so last night we looked at what it means to be thankful in Christ. Tonight we're going to look at what it means to be thankful in everything, which actually kind of still connected to the first day. On uh, tomorrow night, we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, one thing that the young, young people and even adults really want to know is, God, what's your plan and will for my life? Well, we're going to talk about that. And then that Tuesday night, we're really going to take a look at what it means concerning you. And so it really comes down to a place of thankfulness. And last night was a challenge. Last night was more, if you want to call it, our evangelistic night. Because we really dove in and looked at 
in the, the 40 minutes that we were there, maybe 50, maybe an hour, I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> sometimes it keeps going. But um, we talked about what it means to be in Christ. And we really took a, a look at that, what Christ did for us and the benefits that we get from being in Christ. And, and uh, you know, there were some hands. I didn't lead anybody in, in prayer, like in a sinner's prayer or anything like that. But I did ask them to bow their heads and if they had any questions about salvation, were interested or concerned or had thoughts or ideas, just to raise your hand. And, and, and then I asked the servant team to really look and to capture who that was so that maybe there might be some, some God conversations throughout the week. And you may have already heard, but there was a young lady who accepted Jesus as her Savior last night. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Now, I'm not going to tell you who that is. It's, that's not my story to tell. Some of you guys might already know, so, but it's a beautiful thing when you see that happening. And so that's the way God was working through last night. And it's really an extension to where we are at this morning. He has taken what, what God laid up on my heart for the week, and he's brought it here for you guys so you guys can kind of get a glimpse of what we're talking about down there. Now, it's not the exact same messages. There's pieces but God is also, he is uh, taken today and he's really catered it to where the audience is this morning. And I hope and pray that you really, truly, really grasp what God is trying to speak to you and wanting to speak to you this morning. And, and right now, it's, it's about right now, it's almost 11. So right now, just picture this. The kids are probably gathered together laughing, covered in chalk colored dust. That's where they're at right now. So at 1030, they, they had what they call a color war. They filled up these, I think, like mustard bottles, and they, I don't, I've never been part of one. I missed it. I'm here with you guys, right? I, it's one thing I was actually looking forward to, but it just happened that's where it was scheduled, and that's okay. But then they just run around and hit each other with, with this uh, color war, and it's fun for the kids, fun for the adults, and that's about what they're doing right now. And I know that they have planned a lot of other things throughout the rest of this week that's going to build camaraderie, unity, and it's all built upon the foundation and around the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? So, and again, I know it's about prayer. I'm just saying, throw up a prayer for them right now because they're going to have their time together. They're going to be in the Word together, encouraging one another. And you're going to have time at the end of this service to spend some time in prayer with them, for yourselves, for this church. Um, and I'll, if it hasn't been mentioned, we'll explain these, these bands um, here at the end. And so this morning, God has really taken this message, and it's really about what God is doing in and through you, because you guys are here, and you guys are hearing the words right now. And so our first point here is the reality of thankfulness, all right? Let me, let me stop real quick. Let's pray, and then let's get into it. Father, Lord, we love you. Again, thank you for this time. Thank you for the music that really prepared our hearts. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Lord God. Making melody, rejoicing, Lord. That's what really draws us into the presence of being filled with the Spirit. And right now, I ask and pray that everybody in the auditorium, <clears throat> wherever they might be with you right now, I'm not sure, but that, Lord God, they might be filled, those who know Jesus as their Savior. And they might be controlled by your Spirit, open for conviction, open for tears, open for joy, open for rebuke and admonishment, open for encouragement and edification. Whatever it is your spirit might have for us today, Lord, we're, we're depending upon that. That's why we're here. It's to glorify you. And we want to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, show us through thankfulness, through that simple word of being thankful, how we can be closer to you. Watch over the youth. Watch over the servant team. Please protect them. Protect everybody in this building as we learn. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So there's a reality of thankfulness, right? And you know, that word reality is actually what actually is happening right now, right? So there's all these reality shows. That's not reality. That is not real reality, you know? Social media is not actually very social at all, right? So you've got all these words tagged to something that's not even true. So like a reality show, they have all these cameras following people around, and then a cameras are on them. So how can you actually have reality 
when cameras are, you're gonna be somebody different, right? You're not gonna be who you are. True reality is if somebody was following you around, videotaping you without you knowing, that's what reality is, right? And that's illegal, or it's supposed to be illegal, right? <laughs> but that's illegal. And so really, I, I remember I heard this from Brownie, and I think Josh Minson did, maybe a few others, that years ago when Brownie was um, a youth pastor, he was talking to the youth about um, how you're three different types of people. You're who you are when you're at home, you're who you are when you're at church, and you're who you are when you're at school. And one little boy raised his hand and said, yeah, but there's a fourth. Uh, you, are, you, you are who you are when you're alone. He's like, yeah, that's true, you know. And so that's reality. When you're alone by yourself or with those that you're closest to, my wife really knows the reality of who I am, right? You know a portion of that, but not all of it, right? But there is a reality of thankfulness. It's the truth of what thankfulness truly is. And you can't find that reality in this world. It's got to only be found in the Word of God. So there's a difference between thankfulness that is found in the world and that is found in God. There's two different, it's, it's different. And as you see up here, thankfulness in the world is limited by what's happening around us, okay? Last night, um, we really focused on a phrase of, of all things, right? And in, in Ephesians chapter 5.20, it says, be thankful for all things. Well, the definition of all things is all things. It's everything. So that we're supposed to be thankful for everything that happens in life. Not just in everything that we're going to talk about tomorrow night, but for everything. Well, see, if you have a worldly thought process with that phrase, that's never going to happen in your life. You'll never be thankful for all things. It's difficult, even through the darkness, even through the bad things that happens, it's hard to be thankful for that. And, and, you know, you guys, we, all you got to do is turn on the TV and see the darkness that's around the world. But see, the difference is, is that the world only sees the here and the now, where in God, thankfulness sees the eternity, right? It says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. So see, somebody in Christ, they understand it, that this negative thing that happened has happened, but God's going to use it for good. Last night at the very end, Josh um, shared some sad news that, um, and I think the pastor, um, the youth pastor from Midtown, he preached the conference last year, and um, I believe his name is Jeff, and, and um, at, the, at Midtown, his student body that he oversees just this past couple of weeks, there was uh, one of his youth students that was gunned down and killed. Well, that's terrible. And so Josh, you know, tried to encourage him the best you can and just to let him know, brother, I'm praying for you. But he texts back saying, you know what, I, I, and, and it, these aren't the exact words, he read them, but it was something along the line that I can't think but that God's going to use this for good somehow. Because why? He believes what Scripture says. Scripture says, for all things work together for good. So it all depends upon what lens you're looking through. So when you look at the worldly, it's, it's limited by what's happening around you. Thankfulness can only, it's limited by what you see and what is happening. We live in a world of selfishness. We live in a world of entitlement. And so when something does, somebody does something for us, it can, it can be there for a moment, but it may just slowly fade away. It's often determined by what interests you, what you're interested in, what you experience. That's where our thankfulness is really hinged upon. It's constantly changing and depends upon what we're exposed to, right? And, and many of you have heard this before, so this is a quick review, but there's a few things that makes you who you are today. And what I've learned and what I've heard, there are four things that make you who you are today. And one is our genetics, right? Our genetics make us. Mom and dad came together, had a baby, and, and we look like our moms and dads, you know, our hair, our eyes, our nose, our short height. My mom and dad was short, so guess what? This is what you get, right? This is the way God chose, and amen to that, right? And so our genetics has a lot to do with who we are and, and what's going to take place in our life. But there's another piece of genetic. That's the physical. 
But genetically speaking, there's also sp spiritual genetics that we, everybody here, has inside of you. And many have heard the story of Adam and Eve thousands of years ago. God said, you know, you can eat of any tree of the garden, but don't eat of this one that's in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, they did. They ate of it, and they died, but they didn't die physically right then. As we know, they died spiritually. They lost the spirit of God, and in that moment, they took upon a sinful nature, genetically we all have a sinful nature because when Adam and Eve had children, they were sinners and they handed that down to their children, down to their children, down to you and me. And so genetically, that makes up who we are, right? That's, that's what makes up who we are spiritually. We're all sinners by nature. And you might say, well, that's, that's not my fault. No, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to do something about it. And God always gives us the opportunity to do something about it. Another one is our is our environment, right? Our environment makes us who we are. If, you're, if we're raised in a poor environment, you might have a different outlook on life than somebody who's raised in a good environment. My mom did the best she could raising two boys by herself, and I didn't have a father in, my home, in the home. You know what? That had a, a big impact on me and, and brought me to the place of the person that I am today. I mean, if I had a dad in the home, it could have been worse, could have been better, but that environment has a lot to do. Now think about this. If sin has come in the world, well, sin itself has disrupted our environment. So you have sinful people that can only create a sinful environment, right? Which leads down to you personally, our choices. Now there's a fourth one, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is when he created you and made you, he had a plan and purpose, and he's in control of everything, yet you have free will. Now you explain that to me. That's a little difficult to understand. But we live by faith, we believe by faith that God's sovereignty is intact and is at hand, but we have free will. So these choices that we make, those choices have a big to do with who we become. Most of you know my, my, my testimony. I used to be a drug addict. It was my choice to pick up that drug. It was my choice to pick up that alcohol. It was my choice to be a hoodlum and, and to be a bad person when I was a kid. It was so funny, and, 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 and I'm going to bring out Titus in this. I was going to show this to you, but I, I didn't have time. Um, my uncle, um, this is kind of a sidebar. My uncle, he passed away about, I don't know, a month ago, and he's at home with the Lord. But yesterday... My cousin sent me a picture of me in 1987, what I look like. Had a, and there's nothing wrong. I had a deaf, I should have just put it up here, but I had a deaf leopard shirt on. I was sporting a mullet, you know. And, and, and actually, I think I even had highlights in my hair back then, you know. They called it frosting back then. It's highlights now, it's frosting, right? And so here's what I'm saying. There's not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being dressed. There's nothing wrong. But I can tell you that that person from the choices at the age of 14 was already in me that made me and, uh, and led me to a place to become a drug addict and alcoholic. Because that, that's about the time I was really becoming a bad, a bad kid, you see. But yet, when, that's not my identity anymore. When I accepted Jesus as my Savior, my identity is now in Jesus Christ. That was my choice to move out from that. And so everything we just talked about here, I mean, it can be your choices of work, a musician, sports, whatever it might be, you're going to make that choice, and that choice is going to determine who you're going to become. So our environment, our sinful environment, because a sinful man and sinful individuals, guess what? They're going to cause a lot of problems, and they're going to create a lot of good and bad experiences in our lives, right? And so much of this... Much of what we know because of this sin nature and who we are, it leads us back to those poor decisions, but it leads us to an improper thought process of what true thankfulness is, right? It leads us back, because of a sinful nature, it leads us back to a place of selfishness. It's what we determine, what we determine we're going to be happy about. It never satisfies, it'll never satisfy in your life, and it will slowly diminish and fade away. 
This person might be thankful to you. Someone might do something for you, and you'll remember it for a moment, and then all of a sudden it just slowly fades away. See, this type of thankfulness, it's a worldly thankfulness, and it's going to end when you end, when you take your last breath. But there is a thankfulness that is in Christ Jesus, and it's unlimited by what's happening inside of us. It's not determined by what's happening around us. It's determined by what's happening inside of us. Because when it's inside of us, we start seeing things a little bit differently. We can see the negative things, the bad things that happen through the eyes and through the lens of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's determined by what God is interested in. It's a beautiful thing. And as a child of God and as you grow in him, what interests him starts interesting you. What his desires start becoming your desires. And it's being, this thankfulness is constantly being built up on what's and who's inside of you. It's seen beyond your circumstances. And see, God wants you to understand and give thanks through that lens now. And here's, here's why he wants you to do it now. Because in Revelation chapter 7, verse 12, it says, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. He says, for all of eternity, we're going to do nothing but thanks. Give him thanks. See, you're an eternal being now if you know Christ. So he wants you to start now. See, this type of thankfulness is, is an eternal thankfulness. It's an eternal gratitude. You're going to hear me use those words together, thankfulness and gratitude. See, we're to re be reminded now what Jesus did for us because we're going to be reminded in eternity what Jesus did for us. So it begins when you begin. And like last night we talked about, this begins when you are found in Christ. When you enter in Christ, that's when you can really understand what true biblical godly thankfulness is. But as we've talked about this sinful nature, it has a way of destroying something that is so important to God. It comes down to the reality of our heart. Thanksgiving, either way, is a heart issue. And it comes down to who's sitting on the throne of your heart. Is it God or is it yourself, you see? And it's one of two because if you know Christ as your Savior today, you have both natures in you. And they are fighting for the allegiance of your heart. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, I hope and pray you will accept Christ and you will understand what that means and you have a desire to know what that means. But you won't be able to relate to this because you only have one nature and it's a sinful nature. And you are bound. And we sang a song talking about those chains being broken. When I met Jesus 25 years ago, the, 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 the change of alcohol and addiction was gone. He broke those chains. And he can do it for you today. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, whatever it is has chained you up and bound you up. Jesus wants to break you from that. But you have, if you know Christ, you have this, this battle going on, and whichever one you give into is the one that's going to have allegiance. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, good and bad. Those things that just pour out of your life and depending upon who's sitting on the throne of your heart is going to depend upon what comes out of your heart, okay? So what's pouring from your heart today? What's pouring out of your life? If our heart's not right, then our thanksgiving will not be right. If you are on the throne, okay, if you're sitting on the throne, if you're on the throne, you will experience ingratitude because his way is may not line up with yours. And as I was studying this out, thankfulness and gratitude are very close. But thankfulness is something you experience from within. But what it does, it shows itself out through gratitude, right? And what gratitude is this? It's the readiness to be in, uh, of appreciation and kindness. So when someone does something for you or God does something for you, there's a thankfulness there. But if it extends, it extends into gratitude, and you're ready to show appreciation, and then that, has, that will find itself falling out from you in a place of kindness. And so, but if you're on your throne, you're going to experience ingratitude 
because God's ways may not line up with yours. And I just got a couple examples here I want to share with you. Um, we're not going to go anywhere in Scripture. It's just two stories in the Bible. And one of them is Jonah. If you guys remember, right, Jonah was called out by God to go to Nineveh and reach the people, right? But what we see through the life of Jonah is that he had a lack of thankfulness. There was absolutely no gratitude in his life. There was no appreciation, and he had no kindness in him. See, Jonah was part of one of the greatest um, revivals in history. All he had to do was go and tell them the message that God had, and he ran the opposite direction. And when God finally got his attention, he went, he preached, and the whole nation repented unto the Lord. And this is what Jonah 4, 1 says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He was angry because these men and women and children accepted the Lord and they repented. Now, you know what? That would be right now like you and I would be angry because that young girl at camp got saved last night. Isn't that crazy to think about? But here is a man of God, a prophet of God. Even in the boat, he, he was telling them that I'm a prophet of God, I fear the Lord. There was absolutely no fear of the Lord in him because he was running the opposite direction. Jonah missed out on a huge blessing he missed out on, on, on learning from the Lord, learning how to show compassion, learning what the true heart of God was. He missed out on that. He couldn't be thankful for salvation for thousands because his heart was not right before the Lord. You know, he was thankful. When that took place, he goes up on a hill, and it was in the heat of the day, and, and, and God grows up a gourd, and it covers him. He was thankful for that because he was no longer in discomfort. But then the next day, so he was more thankful for the gourd than he was the people. And then the next day when that worm came up and ate that gourd and it fell, he had more pity. He had more pity on that gourd than he did on the souls of those that were saved. You see, when our hearts aren't right and we're sitting on our own thrones, things will be out of order. We're going to have wrong priorities. We're going to be thankful for the things we ought not, and we're not going to be thankful for the things we are. Sounds like the world that we're in today. Everything's twisted. Everything's backward. And thankfulness has a lot to do with it. Jonah's heart was focused on the wrong thing. He allowed his personal prejudices to get in the way. And this is one of the biggest things, that, one thing that God really spoke to me about, and I hope you capture this. Just being a believer is not enough to protect you from a darkened heart. He was a prophet of God, but yet his heart was dark. So just, I'm going to say that again, just being a believer is not enough to protect you from a darkened heart. We can allow a lot of darkness in, even as believers. The wrong focus will cause you to run from God, from what God is running to. He causes, it causes us to run away. So here, here what we can apply is that a heart of selfishness will always replace what is important to God with what's important with you because you're on the throne. A heart of selfishness will always replace what is important to God with what's important to you. But then we have the other side. What if God's on the throne? If God's on the throne, you'll be thankful even when his ways don't line up with yours. And the example that we're going to use here is Paul and Silas. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. They're beaten. They're hurt, physically beaten and hurt, and they're thrown into the inner prison. And at midnight, they prayed, and they sang praises unto the Lord. And there was an earthquake, and when that earthquake hit, the gates of, the jail, of those jail cells opened up. And when that jailer, when he woke up, he thought that everybody had escaped, and he was going to take his own life because he knew he would have been killed. But Paul stopped him. And Paul said, no, we are all here. Don't do that. You know, Paul and Silas... They got to be a part of a huge blessing. They got to see God working right in the midst. Not only did they see the salvation of many, but they got to be a part of kingdom history. They got to be a part of kingdom future. See, we get to be a part of that too because we have that story here in front of us now. We have what to do and what not to do. And if we take what to do, we get to be a part of these blessings. Why? Because God was on the throne of Paul's heart. 
They got to experience God moving and changing lives to bring them to a place of gratitude, which brought them to a place of appreciation. And then they showed kindness, and this man's family got saved. The whole family has changed because of this. Paul's heart was focused on the right things. He didn't allow his personal pain to get in the way of what God was doing. He took that personal pain, and God took it and used it for good because that's the goodness of our God. So no matter where God's will and plan leads, in everything you can give thanks if your heart is right before the Lord. You know, um, and I believe this is true for all of us, we often see life through our hearts, right? Through the lens of our hearts. If your heart is damaged, you're going to see damage in everything. But if your heart is healthy, you're going to see the health of God in everything, no matter it is what you face. Because that's the way we see life. We see it through our hearts. God meant it to be that way. But he doesn't want you to have to sit there and look through a damaged heart. You know what? He's in the, he, he's, what, as Alex Chippy would say, he's the impossibility specialist. You know? The, th what you think's impossible, he will bring to pass in your life. He's still in the business of making the crooked straight. And he can do that for you. But sometimes we allow our experiences to get in the way of God's experiences. And we don't want to go any further because we might be afraid of what's going to happen, of the unknown. But I assure you, what God has for you far outweighs anything what this world can offer. So you have to be careful. Who is sitting on the throne of your heart? So that leads us to a question, how are you to know? How are you to know? Because sometimes we get blind. We're so close, we can't see what's going on. We know that there's something wrong. We might be treating our friends and family improper, or, or something else is going on in our lives. So how are we supposed to know? So I have a question also, another one. What are you hanging out with? Not who are you hanging out with, but what are you hanging out with? And, and, and I think you'll understand the answer to that as we move on into the message, right? Because God has given us the reality of indicators in our life. There are indicators that we have that will tell us where we are at. Allow the Word of God to show you. I know that can be scary at times. That's what the Bible is. It's a mirror. You look into it. It's the only book out there that while you're reading it, it's reading you. It's telling you about your life. And that's why a lot of people, we put it down because of the convictions that it brings about in our life. But the convictions are good because God has used those in your life to change you, to help you because he loves you, right? So he's given us some indicators. There are indicators in his word God has given in order to gauge where we stand, right? So when we look at this, there is what company do you keep? And I think you understand that. I'm having company over tonight. But what company does thankfulness keep? What company does unthankfulness keep? So being unthankful, when you're unthankful, we're going to see this, it produces darkness in our hearts. I mean, that might sound, you might, well, really? Yes, it does. Because this is what Scripture says. It enhances darkness within it produces darkness within our life, and it opens up to more darkness. Can unthankfulness really do that? Yeah, it absolutely can. And here's why. Up on the screen, you're going to see Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 25, and I'm just going to read through it, okay? So there's an ingratitude, there's an unthankfulness here in this world. See, this passage right now, Paul is writing about lost people. And you know what? God has written in our hearts that there's a true living God. But what he's telling us is people have taken that knowledge and that understanding and, and they've twisted it. So I want you to see the company that unthankfulness keeps. It says here, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, and became, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, there you go, to dishonor their own bellies be between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. 
So here you have a situation where someone's saying, I know what's better. I know God created me because it's in them. They know it. They might deny it, but they know it. But they're, de they're denying that. And I want you to see, look at the company that unthankfulness keeps. It keeps a glorified him not. It says they were unthankful. It keeps words like vain and foolish and darkened, changing God's glory. It keeps the word fools, corruptible, uncleanness, lust, dishonor, change the truth, a lie. This is what unthankfulness keeps. This is the company that it is surrounded by. And you might say this is a little extreme. Yes, but it's what the scripture says. And lack of thankfulness reveals true idolatries in our life. That's what this is about here. Anytime you replace God in your heart, you're replacing him with something else. That means you're worshiping it. And when you worship that, that is idolatry, okay? And so right now this is telling, when you don't have thankfulness in your life, that means your focus is off of him and it's on something else, and now immediately idolatry is entered in. It goes, it goes further than this. We don't have time, um, but you can read the rest of it and rest of this, this chapter and see all the other words that keeps company with not being thankful. But there's another one here in the ingratitude in the church. This one here is really more about the loss, but this is what we can find in the church. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, 5. Now, I didn't highlight these because these are back to back to back to back. You can see it, right? It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self. Turn on the TV, watch some sports. Covetous, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Look at that. Right there in the middle, unthankful unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You'll find that within the church and without, but he's talking to Timothy right now about being a pastor within the church. Look at the company that unthankfulness keeps. You know a lot about somebody or something by what company they keep. I remember hearing from a pastor a long time ago that said, um, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future, right? Well, you can say the same thing about this. If you show me your not being thankful, I can show you a list of other things that are not far behind. Obviously, as a believer in Christ, you won't be able to identify with all of these, and I hope you don't, but you can identify with some. Being unthankful doesn't mean that all of what we've read are directly a part of our lives, but being unthankful is a slippery slope that leads to everything that we just read. This is a time right now, church, to take more inventory of our lives and to really be honest with us. If you're struggling with it, these young people are struggling with it. And they're struggling with things that we have no idea, that we couldn't even imagine. And if they're struggling with it, I'm telling you right now that the adversary is attacking you and attacking them with his full arsenal, and he sticks to what he knows works. That's why thankfulness is so important. But if there's a company of being unthankful, we, we can't go without looking at the company with being thankful, amen? This is, this is the beauty of the whole thing. Being thankful produces peace in our hearts and our minds. Thankfulness has a big part of that. In Philippians 4, 4 through 7, now just listen. I have highlighted on here what thankfulness, what being thankful for keeps company with. It says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, see there, thanksgiving's nestled right there in the middle. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What a promise. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these, right? The battle's here and the battle's here. 
But right now, we are seeing what thankfulness keeps company with. This is what thankfulness keeps company with. Rejoice, moderation, supplication, peace, honesty, truth, just, pure, lovely, report, virtue, praise. This is what it keeps company with. And on this next slide, I don't have them all up here, but I want you to look at this real quick on this next slide. I've just put a few up here. And it gives you more of, a, 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 of what you can actually see of each one is connected with. When you're unthankful, vain, darkness, corruption, lust, lies, unholy, blasphemy, covetousness is all there right a part of it. Okay? But when you're thankful, wow, look at that list. There's rejoicing, there's prayer, there's peace. There's just, there's pure, there's virtue, there's praise, there's God's word. There's so many more, and it just keeps going on. But the other list also keeps going on, too. And so you have to ask yourself, which list do you identify with the most? And if you're going to be honest with yourself, it may not feel too good. It may not feel right. But that's the beauty of where we're at right now, because God wants to make what is twisted and he wants to make it right what is crooked he wants to make straight and so we're, i'm going to be sharing a little bit of this tonight with the youth right and so you have that okay so what do we do about this and and, and this is what i'm going to do i'm just going to use invisibility right now but the youth tonight i'm actually going to have them all come up and we're going to have a whole long line right because because this is an illustration that I saw from a pastor, and I've actually used it over in Zambia, and, and, it, and it works well, because you're either in one. Now, again, also, some of it does this too, right? This isn't just you're either here or you're either here. Some of those things flow into the other. So I'm not talking about the moments of weakness, those moments that you have that you trouble, mostly the habitual. Are you habitually living in the right column or in the left, right? And, and, and whichever nature is, is, is you're feeding the most of the one that's going to win. So what do we do in order to make sure that we are on the right and not the left? So I'm going to use an example of this, okay, um, this young girl, right? I guess I'm playing the role of a young girl right now, right? Who just got saved last night. So she got saved, and here she is. She's excited. She's joyful. She's looking forward to the mentorship that she has from these youth, Right? And all of a sudden, she's thankful, and part of a wall is built up in front of her, right? And then she starts rejoicing, and it adds to that wall. Then she starts praying, and it adds to that wall. And then there's peace, and there's justness in her life. And over here, she's, she's building purity. She's going to be pure in her mind and her heart, and physically. And she's going to have virtue, which is life and praise. And it goes on and on, and truth. And the wall just keeps getting built. And you know what she has now? She has liberty. She has the freedom to live back behind this wall and she can go back and forth and she can enjoy the presence of God. She can enjoy the fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And time goes on and she stops giving thanks. And all of a sudden, she's doing okay over here and over here and all of a sudden, thanks. And that wall goes down a little bit. And weeks go by and she's not thankful anymore. And all of a sudden, it goes down. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, that piece is down. There's a breach in the wall, and the adversary now has direct access right to that young lady or young man who gets saved. You see? So here's the thing. It's just one piece of the wall, but it's an important piece. That can happen with any other piece of this wall, but right now we're talking about thankfulness. And the moment that that piece is broken down and the adversary has opened to attack, these are some things he's going to bring into our lives. Disappointment. See, when you're back there living in liberty with the Lord, there's no disappointment. It's just excitement. It's confidence. You're thankful. But there's disappointment now, now um, comes into your life. Discouragement. Despair, right? Disbelief. You start doubting things that God has shown you. There comes more distractions. The adversary brings distractions into your life. There might be some dishonesty that comes in. There's a deadness. You start feeling like there's something missing in your life. Discord starts getting erupted in your life with your friends and your family. 
discontentment. What you are content with with God, no longer are you content with. Disobedience might show up, and then eventually disassociation. You're no longer with the body of Christ. All because we allowed the breach in the wall. See, that's what you've got to do. You've got to identify where you are at, but you've got to understand God has given me a wall for protection, right? Because let me tell you, that other wall, it's already built. That wall is built in people's lives. And so when a person gets saved, immediately some of those things will come crashing down and you've got to tear down those walls. But these here, they've got to be built up. And they've got to be built up strong because that's what God has given us in our lives. See, thankfulness can only take place in your life if you are truly there, right? And again, I understand there's some flow over. I get it. It happens. But the world is trying to build up these wrong walls around you and around these young people. And we've got to recognize what God has done for us. We've got to recognize and then determine that we're going to allow him to be on the thrones of our heart in this chaotic world, okay? Thankfulness is only one part of that wall, but it's a very, very important part of that wall. And if you stop being thankful, there's going to be a breach. You cannot allow that breach. So you've got to build the wall, right? Now here's the thing. You can talk uh, to anybody that knows this church, right? Brownie, Dwayne. You can talk to, to Josh, Coach, many others that's been here for years. And you know what? This building looks exactly the same way it did when it was built. It just took care of itself. It's maintenance-free building, isn't it? No, that's not true. There's been a lot of tears and sweat and money poured in to make sure that we maintain this wall or this building, right? It takes a lot of effort. You can't just build something and, and expect it to take care of itself. So when you allow God to build this wall in your life, right? Right here, the wall is built. It's going to take constant maintenance. You're going up and down the wall, and you're working on your rejoicing. You're spending more time in prayer. You're over here, and you're, you're making a commitment to God for pure thoughts and living a virtuous life. And then all of a sudden, you're down here, and this is the beauty. You're not doing it alone. The Holy Spirit of God says, okay, Brian, I need you to come down here. I need you to work over here. No, now I need you to be over here. You've spent enough time there, I need you to do this. It's constant maintenance. And the moment you step back and you stop maintaining the wall, that's when the breaches start showing up. So you've got to make sure you tear down some, but you maintain the others. You build them up. And if you don't know which one it is or where it is in your life, that's the beautiful thing is that you have a church body right now, right here, who can walk you through that. You have a God who loves you, who will show it to you. You have a word that is transparent to you. It's a mirror. It's going to show you in your life the changes you need to make and what you need to do. So don't leave your wall unmaintenanced. Don't, and, and here's the thing, don't leave it up to yourself because anything left to itself is going to fall down. So don't leave it up to yourself, leave it up to God. So the young people that we're ministering to, um, they're dealing with the exact same things we've just discussed. And we're really working hard towards helping them to build these walls. And one of the ways that that's going to take place is by your efforts. And, and you may not know them, you may not, might not be directly connected with them, but the way it's going to help them is by prayer. Directly praying for these young people is going to help them build the walls. It'll help them maintain the walls. It'll help them to know what voices to listen to and what voices not to listen to, you see. And so now this is going to be your opportunity. Here in a second as we close, I'm going to pray. Um, and why don't you go ahead and stand up real quick. Here, well, I'm going to pray. And just pray for you as a congregation. But now you have an opportunity to make a difference, not only in your own life, but in the life of these young people. Down here are these, these wrist bracelets here, and they have a name of every student that is down there at camp. And I'm encouraging you now, not only to come forward and deal with and, 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 and have business with the Lord in your own life, but grab one of these, okay? There should not be any of these left by the end of service. Grab one of these and make a commitment to pray for the person that's on your arm. You can pray for all of them, but pray specifically for that one, okay? Because we want them to also not only build walls, but maintain them. We want thankfulness to be in their life. We want them to keep the right company and not keep the wrong. 
And God wants the same for you guys. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. And uh, we understand that uh, without you, we can do nothing. And Father God, um, there's many here that are in that left column completely. They've never met Jesus. And Lord, they have to recognize that they are sinners and they are separated from you. And until they repent and recognize their sin and believe that Jesus Christ died for them specifically and they confess him as their savior and they receive that beautiful gift of salvation, until that day comes, they're gonna remain in that left column. And I pray if there's someone here today, today is the day of salvation, that they will make that decision. And for those, Lord God, who are saved, Lord, um, help us to remain in that right column, to really, to fix some of the breaches, maybe to really desire and what you desire, to want what you want, and that your spirit might help us to maintain everything that we talked about in that right column. I pray for these youth right now as they're having a good time, challenge them with life, challenge them with truth, challenge them with salvation, and help them in, to, to put down the sin in their life so they might go after you. So, Father God, do the work you do best in our lives and our hearts, and uh, just lead us individually how we ought to pray for ourselves, plus also for this church, for our pastor, but also for these young people. We love you and praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the time right now. You can come forward.